Welcome to Experimental. In this series, I'm going to be trying hobbying products, painting techniques and approaches that I am completely unfamiliar with and see what they can be used for. Do not expect my work to come out looking fantastic. Unlike the best out there, there is so much I don't know. But by painting bravely, maybe we can discover some new techniques together. And don't worry, I'll be sharing all the difficulties I have so that you know that when it doesn't go right for you, it happens to us all. I got a hold of this range of Liquitex liquid inks and Mr. Hobby liquid mask over Christmas. I want to see if I can work out how to use these inks through an airbrush and whether or not this mask is a viable way to mask off any progress I make. To get started, I don't want to be using any models that I'm serious about painting. So it's time to pull out my box of minis from way back when. Let's see what I got. Back in the 90s, I remember Necromunda coming out and it was my jam. I wanted all the models as they looked so awesome and the game just caught my imagination. At that time, I wasn't serious about painting as you can see, but I did collect almost every gang there was. Although I would love to paint up these heavies, I'm thinking the mutants are going to be the best for this little experiment as the inks should have lots of vibrancy so we can imagine that they're glowing from radiation. Okay, I found seven mutants. That should be enough to get us started. We're going to put down a zenithal prime with black primer and let's use the white ink from above and see how it works for priming. I tried thinning the ink down with equal measures of airbrush flow improver and distilled water and it still lays down well without spider webbing. It flows through the airbrush really well. There is very little or no splatter and I could see the layers build opacity allowing for smoother blends between the white and black. This is definitely how I am going to be zenithal priming my models from now on. Now we get to play with color and to try out as many as possible we are going to apply one ink from above and another from below. Let's begin with a big mutant and a small mutant trying a blue from below and green from above. The blue has a good transition to the white but where it was applied to black it really does stay black. The first green I put over the white zenithal priming appeared almost turquoise. Again its translucency gave a nice blend but once it reached the dark blue it had no effect on it. The models were lacking the intensity of color I was looking for with a radioactive glow so I pulled out the vivid green and made some more controlled passes over the models. Now my airbrush is just a cheap knockoff and my experience is very limited with airbrushes but these inks are far more easy to direct than regular acrylics through the airbrush and I could get a more intense glow on the highlights. With the next model I tried a red pass over the whole model to see how the zenithal prime affected the ink's properties. It's very interesting to see just how much of the contrast is kept with inks. When using regular acrylics, although having translucent properties, the inks are far more translucent while retaining a lot of intensity of color. Let's now use deep violet for the shadows and see how it will come out on one of the models. It's now very clear that having such a contrasting xanthal prime of white to black might be too much for the inks. The black just sucks any color out of the ink. Perhaps with a gray base for the priming, the shadow could have greater variation in color. Oh well, let's keep moving on with these mutants. Curious to see how the violet would act on a white base, I colored the leader's hair with it and was very pleased with the result. The light to dark violet looked great. I can see using this for an army's color scheme and getting a quick intense result for their primary color. We tried violet as a shadow for the red, but what happens if we use the green shade? Well, with it being on the opposite end of the color wheel, it made our blacks ever more intense. Very useful to know if we want to make a strong contrast of color without using monochromes that reduce color contrasts. One of the colors in the sets is this cerulean blue hue. I've no idea how to use this one. Let's give it a go though. Perhaps a green shade first, then the blue from above? I don't know. It looks okay, I guess, but just not the color I'm really fond of, to be honest. Now time to see what this burnt umber looks like. This is a transparent ink, so let's see what happens when we just apply it to a model with a zenithal prime. Okay, so it certainly retains all the contrast of black to white. It's just made it brown. Looks like it will be good for glazing. I can see going over metallics with this to give a rusted, oily look. Right, it's time to try out this liquid mask. I really liked the hair on the leader. Let's try masking it, ready for another pass with the airbrush. Oh wow, this is goopy. It's going everywhere. Oh, this is really hard to control. Uh, let me go and try and get this sorted. 
Okay, it's dried and it did not stay where I wanted. It always slipped away from the raised areas I wanted coated. It probably didn't need that much coated on and still produces a thin film over the areas covered. Uh, I can pick some bits off, but it's proving difficult. Let's just get into painting the body. I haven't used the yellows yet, so let's try yellow orange azole. Ooh, this is nice. It gives a nice dirty yellow, and as it makes contact with the violet, it transitions into a beautiful orange. The model looks a mess, but it's great to see how the inks interact with one another as they blend. Let's use the remaining yellow in the airbrush to further highlight the heavy. The yellow helps intensify the green a bit, but not much. The layers are getting a bit too thick on this model now anyway. I also have a yellow medium azole. Let's put that on this model with the red. As expected, it helped make an orange glow on the highlights. It almost looks like fire. I'm really impressed with the transitions these inks make. Let's just make one more pass on the lead with a lighter yellow. Oh, it lightened it a bit, but otherwise not much different. Okay, I'm curious. What happens if we put this yellow over that light blue model? That makes a pretty vivid green. I may have found a use for that blue now. Moshe's vast, the army has a lot of ivory in their color scheme. Could there be a way to produce a similar effect using the inks? Let's take the burnt umber model, mix some white with the burnt umber and... Hmm... Not quite what I was looking for. The white ink is very intense and I don't have the skill to layer the paints the way I want them for my army. Uh, this is not going to be an option for me. Now, you remember I masked the leader? Well, he should be good and dry now, so let's carefully remove the mask and... Oh god, no. That beautiful violet has come off with the mask. On the other hand, it has removed the paint so cleanly. I don't think I've ever seen a metal miniature shine so intensely before. I probably should have sealed the miniature with varnish before trying to mask it. Oh well, live and learn. We've tried painting these models with an airbrush. How about just using a regular brush? Because these inks flow so much, I will use an old brush. You don't want all the ink to run up into the ferrule and ruin your expensive sable brushes. The first thing I'm noticing is that they keep all the contrast information under them through their translucency. But unlike washes, the paint is much easier to control. I didn't find it running into unwanted areas. The other surprising characteristic was the intensity of the ink's color seemed to increase as it dried. My experience with regular miniature acrylics is that the color will lose intensity as it dries. The opposite seems true here, so it was very difficult to preempt the results. Well, this paint job is not going to win any awards, but it has helped me in understanding some of the properties of inks. Here are the results of the airbrushing. It was a fun experiment. And looking at the experience, there are a few things I would try differently. To try to retain the color of the inks across the model, I want to try priming gray to white, rather than black to white. I also need to be aware of how intensely the inks dry, layer on less, and wait to see what the result is, rather than continually spray overpowering the results. In terms of using the liquid mask, I probably just need to apply less and make sure to varnish the layer I want to protect it first. Well, I could end the video there, Probably should, but nah, let's just try one more time. I found some old Warzone minis of some cultists and decided they would be perfect for continuing this ink experiment. This time I based them gray to white and jumped straight into a vivid green with a blue for the shadows. Okay, next model, let's do the same but start with the shadows. Ah, fairly similar results, just painted one more intensely than the other. For the last model, let's use the red, orange and violet for shadows. Ooh, looks pretty good. Already, thanks to the grey to white priming, the colours are retained across the whole model. Me likey. Learning from my mistakes, let's put a varnish across the models, starting with this green one here. Wait a minute. Is the varnish stripping the inks? Oh, I think it is. Uh, perhaps the brush is too abrasive. Nope, even a softer brush is doing the same. Uh, I only have one model left. Let's try varnishing through the airbrush. The matte varnish goes on smooth and helps take away the glossiness of the inks, making the cloth look much more natural. Nice. Let's paint him up a bit and see how easy it is just to paint as usual. The paint goes on fine and I'm really happy with the blend from the inks. But wait a minute, we haven't tried the masking liquid. Let's give it a go. Let's use it on a flat surface this time and keep the lovely blends on the shoulder pads and knee pads. The cloth can then get a bit more variation put in. I want to protect the guns as well, so an alternative. Let's use post attack to cover them. I'm using the tack I have from my Redgrass painting handle, but it has the same qualities as regular post attack. 
Time to get spraying. To help change the color of the highlights, I gave a very soft white highlight across the model. I was hoping this will allow the color that I add to gain more dominance over these highlighted areas. Then making a pass with yellow, the cloth of the miniature was done. Time to remove the masking. The post attack seems to come off without removing any paint. That's good. Some bits of it remain, but that's easy enough to clean up. Time for the masking liquid. God damn it. Well, at least I have discovered a new way to strip metal minis without the need of foul smelling chemicals. Or not, it seems to work best with regular acrylics. Noted for the future. Well, other than the masking failing completely, I am impressed with what the inks can do. It is hard to use them effectively on such small minis for this kind of two-tone shading, but I can imagine it being really useful for when tackling a large model. Luckily, I will be receiving the Tag Raid Kickstarter with some giant models, and you can be sure I'll be trying out some of these techniques on them. Let me know all the mistakes I made in the comments and how I should get good. Also, what are your experiences with these kinds of inks? How do you use them in your hobbying? Liking and subscribing if you haven't already really helps the channel. And if you want to help us build the community, come on over to our Discord. The link is in the description. See you all in the next video.